In the cool breezes of Eden, brought from the infant earth, one arose, the voice of his creator speaking his identity to life. Adam, man. And as heaven waited short with bread, the creator spoke yet another, Eve, mother of all the living. So it was with Abraham, named in the promise as the father of nations, Peter, the rock upon which the church would stand. The name called to life the destiny within. The name set the stage for all that was to come. And unto us a child was born. And what name could contain his glory? For he was mighty God, as the universe gasped into being, flinging rays of light from his presence to pierce the void, to shatter the shadows to a tapestry of color. And he is mighty God, shattering our darkness, revealing our light, our truth in him. He was everlasting father when orphaned Israel needed a father's touch. When we, with grief-stricken cheeks, need the embrace of one who never leaves. When we have lost our way to dark horizons, it is our everlasting father who lights the way home. He is Prince of Peace. When, like Elijah, we need the still small voice in the turmoil's midst. When, like David, we need the melodies of his presence to soothe our troubled minds. He is sanctuary within our trials, shepherd guiding us to still waters. And yes, he is wonderful counselor. God who gives counsel in the chaos, crafting disorder into calm and failure into beauty. He is a voice for the voiceless. He is dignity for the stateless soul. It is he who raised up a lowly shepherd to become a king. He who took the fishermen of Galilee and made them leaders of history. It is the counselor who redeems our lost years, breaking chains that have kept dreams imprisoned and joy confined. The name reaches across eternity, exclaimed by the splendors of galaxies, sung by the passions of angels, roared in heaven's fervor, exalted in creation's unfettered rejoicing. What name could contain him? What title? What soul renown? For this is our wonderful counselor. This is our mighty God. This is our everlasting Father, our Prince of Peace. What name could contain Emmanuel, God with us, Yahweh, the Great I Am. What name could contain the Word of Life, the Light of the World, the King of Kings, the Lord of All. We bow to the name that holds every other in its matchless worth. What name could contain such a glory? What name but Jesus? We cry Jesus. We cry holy is the name.
the newborn king. We are so glad you've joined us. Remember this time last year? I don't know, I was home on the couch. It had nothing like the power of singing together about the birth of our King and our Savior. We're so glad you've come here tonight. And we're hoping that you will hear a fresh word tonight that will remind you of all that God is doing and is going to do in your life. Why don't you just take a moment, you don't have to shake hands or anything, but just turn to someone, look them in the eye and say, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Well, you're welcome to sit or stand, but we're going to sing and let's rock the house.
Good evening, everyone. Welcome. (laughs) Tonight's Advent reading will be coming from John, 1 John, verses 1 through 5, verse 14. In the beginning, the world already existed. The The word was with God, and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never be extinguished. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory the glory of the Father's one and only Son. The word John is talking about Jesus. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He has been with God from the beginning, giving life and breath to all things. Christmas is a celebration that Jesus became like us. He has lived and died and rose again so that we could have life that lasts forever with God. This Christmas, let's celebrate that Jesus came to rescue us, and God is always with us. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus to be our Savior. Thank you for sending Jesus to be the light in in this world that we can see, in this world that can seem so dark. This Christmas, keep us focused on Jesus, the true reason for why we celebrate. As we remember how much you love us, help us to know how we can show your love to others this Christmas. We love you. We pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Thompson. I love this movie. Do you remember this movie with Anna and Elsa and, oh gosh, what's this guy's name? And I forget about the, the moose too. I can't remember all their names. And I can't remember that song. Uh, gosh, that song, you know, when the, song, when, the, when the movie came out, the song, it went like, uh, I can't remember. Oh, and it, like, it got stuck in your head and like everybody was singing it for like three years or something. Uh, gosh. Um, yes, let it go, let it go, right? You remember? That song though, it reminds me, man, we really should let go of some stuff, shouldn't we? Well, letting go isn't as easy as it sounds. What if the thing that you can't let go of is a big mistake that you made? You'd love to let it go and forget that it even happened, but it just seems to follow you. Well, today I'm going to give you a chance to truly let it go. If you get a piece of paper and a pen, you can write it down and we're gonna let it go. On this piece of paper, you're gonna write something or some things that you're hurting about that you need to let go of. Right here. There was a guy in the Bible, his name was Isaiah, and he wrote some amazing words that can help us let go, if you think about them and kind of meditate on them. Uh, it says in, um, it's Isaiah 43, 18 through 20. And you can read it on your own. It's a, it's, it's, uh, I'm going to summarize it, though. Do not think of the past. Trust in the Lord. So look at what you've written. And what would Isaiah say about that? These things matter to you, and they matter to God, and they matter to me, and they matter to your parents or your grandparents or your family or your friends, those who see you hurting. But most importantly, they matter to God, and God can help you not to bear it alone because he is here. And you know what? God wants to take this hurt and this pain away from you and start something new. You can't move forward to the new and wonderful thing God has for you if you're still holding on to this. Ask God to help you with this thing and let it go, knowing you can't do it on your own. Ask him for that help because that's what he wants. And he's here to help you move on. Let's do this. You ready? Let's pray. Hands up, hands together, hands on your lap, and bow your heads. Lord, we come before you in prayer today, thankful for your mercy and kindness, asking that you would help us to simply let go of all the fears and worries and problems and doubts and guilt and disappointments that seem to be filling our hearts and our minds. Help us to let it go. Amen. See you next time. Let it go, let it go, let it go, let it go, let it go. I don't even know the words. I started singing it, I'm like, I don't know how it goes. Hey, Emmanuel. One of the highlights of Christmas Eve is the Christmas Eve offering. Uh, every year we have this tradition that 100% of the offering that's given that is not designated to anything else goes directly to our benevolence fund. And we use that benevolence fund throughout the course of the year to serve families that are going through a difficult time, maybe have lost a job or in transition. And it's been a real source of blessing. And I can tell you that this past year has been a tremendous year of opportunity for us to bless a lot of families. So I wanna encourage you to go online. And if you go to the giving tab, there is a space that says benevolence. And if you would consider give, giving a benevolence offering, that would be tremendous. And it will go directly to helping 
um, people that are a part of Emmanuel Church family. Thanks so much for your generosity. How can I be up there and just stand right here? I don't know. This is the magic of technology. Hey, welcome Emmanuel family to Christmas Eve. It's totally different this year than last year. We didn't even have Christmas Eve services, so welcome. It's great to see a full house. We're online um, this evening, so for the hundreds of people that are joining us online, welcome as well. I think most families have secrets. Was that my wife that just said that? <laughs> you're sitting on the front row and you just did that? Oh, you're sitting on a cough drop. I do. I think most families have secrets. You know, things that are a part of our past that you'd rather de-emphasize or not focus on at all, like a cousin who spent time in prison or a grandparent that run away with somebody in the office, or a son who has a drug problem, or a mom that has a hidden addiction. Does your family have any secrets? Do you have any secrets? Um, if you do, you should relax because Jesus had family secrets in his history. Did you know that? I mean, Luke starts off his gospel with talking about the Christmas story and, you know, the angels and the shepherds and baby Jesus wrapped in swaddling clothes. And John starts off, we just read this evening, the Christmas story, the McFadden's, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Mark doesn't even have a Christmas story. But you know how Matthew starts off his gospel? Matthew chapter 1. He begins with the genealogy of Jesus. That's how he starts the Christmas story. Now, I don't know. If I was Matthew's publisher, I would say to him, look, with the incredible life that Jesus had, maybe you ought to start off with some compelling story rather than all the begats. How many of you have ever read in the Old Testament, you get to Numbers, like Numbers chapter 12, 13, 14, 15, so-and-so begat so-and-so, and so-and-so begat so-and-so, so-and-so begat so-and-so, and boring, and then you go to sleep and you wake up 20 minutes later and feel guilty because you fell asleep reading your Bible, right? <laughs> Believe it or not, that's how Matthew begins the Christmas story. 42 generations from Abraham to Joseph. Now, I would have done it differently, right? But the reality is, is that Matthew did it for a reason. In Matthew's genealogy, all the begats, Abraham begat Isaac and Isaac begat Jacob, in all the begats, there are four people that have secrets, that have a scandalous past. The first was a young lady by the name of Tamar. Tamar was married to one of Judah's sons, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. One of them was named Judah. And Judah's boy married this girl named Tamar, but unfortunately, the man died. And Tamar didn't have a child to raise and back in those days, there was no social security payments, anything like that. So you really, re when you, if you were a widow or a widower, you really relied on your family system to take care of you. And so Tamar went to Judah and said to him, hey, look, you, you, you know, your son died and I got nothing. Help me out here. And Judah wouldn't give her the time of day. And he blew her off for months. So you know what Tamar did? I'll make this PG. Tamar got dressed up like a certain kind of woman, put a veil over her face, and when Judah went on a business trip, she propositioned him, slept with him, got pregnant. You think your family's messed up? Tamar gets pregnant by her father-in-law. 
a family secret. Why would Matthew put that into the genealogy of Jesus? And then, of course, there's another lady by the name of Rahab. Rahab was a Canaanite. They were the bad guys, and the Israelites were the good guys. And Rahab was another kind of person, just like Tamar disguised herself to be. That was her living. And she was living in Jericho, and two Israelite spies came to check out Jericho because they were going to try to conquer it. And Rahab took them in, hid them, and sent them off safely. And ultimately, Israel destroyed that ancient city of Jericho, and Rahab was spared. And Rahab became an Israelite, and she ended up marrying a guy, get this, by the name of Salmon. No joke. How would you like to be named a fish? A cod. Tilapia. I've had it with you. Come on. That's funny. And listen to this. They had a son named Boaz. Remember that name. A third woman in the genealogy of Jesus, her name is Ruth. Ruth is an illegal immigrant, an undocumented worker. And she's working the fields one day, and she meets this guy named Boaz, and they end up getting married And they end up having a kid named Obed. And Obed was the father of Jesse. And Jesse was the father of King David. Oh, let's talk about David. He's the king of secrets. You remember the story, right, about David and Bathsheba? The writer of 1 and 2 Kings starts off with, In the time when kings go to war, David was home in Jerusalem. That's the first cue that David wasn't where he was supposed to be. And David is deciding in the cool of the day to walk around his palace. And if you've ever seen pictures of Jerusalem, you know that it's on top of Mount Zion, which means that the palace was at the top top of Mount Zion, which meant that all the other houses were below. And so basically when David wanted to walk around, he's looking at everybody's rooftops, which is a little creepy. And then he sees this young woman named Bathsheba. Now, here's what you need to know about David. One moment he's stringing along, going, singing praises and writing psalms to God. The next moment he's lusting after Bathsheba. Come get that woman for me. And you know what happened. They had a child. She got pregnant. Now, here's what's really interesting about how Matthew writes the genealogy of Jesus. He doesn't refer to Bathsheba as David's wife. He refers to Bathsheba as Uriah's widow. Mm. Why would he do that? Because Matthew is intent on stirring up that story. So here's the question that we're all supposed to ask of the Christmas story in Matthew. Why? Why do you intentionally put these four people who have a past as part of Jesus' family secret, why do you put them before you even talk about Mary and Joseph? Why are they in your gospel, Matthew? Here's the reason why. It's Matthew's way of explaining the Christmas story and why Jesus came to begin with. And here it is. Your past does not define your future. Your past secrets, your past sins, your past failures, your inferiorities, your insecurities, they do not define your future. Do you know why? For God so loved the world 
that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves you. God entered this broken world. Haven't we been broken the last couple of years? We felt it, haven't we? God entered this broken world in the form of a little baby, so vulnerable, and says there's hope. The greatest message of Christmas is forgiveness. Because your past does not define your future. One of the greatest stories that Jesus ever told when he was walking on this earth was the parable of the prodigal son. Most people know that story. You know it, right? A man has two boys. The younger son says to his father, I want my inheritance now, the same as saying, I wish you were dead. I can't wait. Unbelievably, the father gives the son his inheritance half and the son goes off and Jesus says that he spent it on wild living. And just at the time when the son ran out of his inheritance, a great famine hit the land and the son had no more money. And the son found himself working for a pig farmer, longing to fill his stomach with what the pigs ate. And then he came to his senses. You ever had a light bulb moment? You ever had a moment where you're like, bing, the lights go on, and you suddenly realize that the life that you've been pursuing isn't that great? So the son decides that he's going to go home, and he realizes that he can't go home as a son anymore. He makes up this thing in his mind that he's going to go home and have this story that tells his father that he's not... He's not worthy enough to be a son anymore that he's going to be one of the father's slaves because at least he'll have three square meals a day. Now listen very carefully. The son doesn't go home because he has somehow rekindled love for the father. He's going home just to survive. And the father is just fine with that. God wants you home. Whatever circumstances brought you to this moment, God wants you home. Whatever secrets that you've been hiding, God wants you home. If you're desperate, God wants you home. Let me ask you the question. What's keeping you from coming home to the love of a father who loves you unconditionally? What is it? What keeps you? Oftentimes it's fear. Oftentimes it's a sense of unworthiness. Oh, God could never accept me because of all that I've done. I've, I've been this, I've been that for 20, 30, 40 years. I've messed up my life. God doesn't care how you got here. God just wants you home. These last couple of years have been crazy. I'm looking at a full house. There are hundreds of people here. There will be hundreds of people in the next service. But this is really the first time it's been like this in about a year and a half. No condemnation, no judgment. People have had to make decisions about whether they should come to church or not come to church, how they connect with God. But I'm making a gamble tonight that some of you, these last couple years, your spiritual life has been torn up. And you're not where you were two years ago. And if truth would be told, You're just barely hanging on. God just wants you home. That's it. And tonight's a good night to come home. Maybe you're here tonight because somebody invited you to come. Maybe this is the first time you've ever been in this church. Welcome. This is a message of hope. 
You're not here by accident. You may think you came just because you're an invitation, but God has been watching you through the years and he's been putting things together to bring you to this moment. And if you feel this little pumping in your heart, like your heart's going a little bit quicker, that's kind of God's way of getting a hold of you to say, I want you to come home. And the cool thing about God is you don't have to have it all figured out. That's faith, right? Faith is taking the leap, trusting that God is going to catch you. And if the timing is right for you this evening to come home to God, I'm going to ask you to repeat a prayer after me. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads right now. Now, all heads bowed, all eyes closed. I'm going to ask you to do one more thing. I know it's going to be a lot for some of you. I'm going to ask you to stand. For those that want to come home to the Father, I'm going to ask you to stand. If you have this little beating heart inside of you that's pounding, that's God speaking to you. Nobody else is going to look around. Nobody else is going to call you out. I'm not calling you out. What I'm asking you to do is to make a decision that will change your life. Because your past doesn't define your future. Because God so loved you. Everything changed at Christmas. So if you would like to start a relationship with Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, who loves you deeply, who died on the cross for your sins and rose from the grave to give you new life, stand up right now. Nobody's going to embarrass you. Just stand up. If that message is appealing to you, get up right now. If you need to reset your spiritual life because these last couple years have been crazy, crazy, stand up. That's it. All around the room, get up. Repeat this prayer after me. If you're standing, just repeat this prayer after me. You're praying to God. God, this is, and then just give your name. I want to begin a relationship with you. Just repeat those words. I want to begin a relationship with you. I want to come home. I'm tired. I'm tired of doing my own thing. I'm tired of running. I open my heart up to you right now. I give you every sinful thing I've ever done. Here, just, just take it. All of it, just take it. I, I, I just, I, I know I'm a sinner. Just take it. Come into my life and change my future. And from this moment on, to the best of my ability, I'm gonna follow you. Show me what that means. Now I'm gonna ask everybody else to stand up right now. There's probably 10, 15 people in this room that stood up. Would you like to express your joy at them coming home? Thank you, thank you. Let's continue to worship. Is that right?
We're so glad that you've come tonight. And hopefully you've, as the week goes on, as you celebrate Christmas tomorrow, there'll be moments of heavenly peace and there'll be moments of chaos. <laughs> hopefully you will see Jesus Christ at work in all and through all. For he is the reason that we have come to celebrate tonight. And we're so glad that you've joined us. We would love for you to take a few things with you tonight. As you leave, you'll find that there are some little Christmas ornaments from Emmanuel Church for your Christmas tree. So make sure you get one to take with you. Stay outside for some cookies or, or hot cocoa. We also have a, a devotional that we're using over the next couple months that you're welcome to take on the tables as you leave. You could take that as well. And we're really excited that this, uh, this Sunday, we're gonna be worshiping online only. So we invite you to go to lansdale.church and you can worship with us from the comfort of your home and enjoy friends and family and sleeping in a little bit. And so we invite you to join us for worship. Also tomorrow morning by 7 a.m., you'll find that there's gonna be a, a, just a short Christmas message posted on, on YouTube. And, and you'll, if you have uh, our app, you'll see that tomorrow morning. So you could have some devotional time with your family. And we wanna encourage you to be a part of that. But overall, we really wanna wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And we're excited to sing as you leave. We're just happy to celebrate tonight that Jesus Christ has come to save us. Amen. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.